Okay, thanks uh, for joining us in Brussels. It's also for us a bit uh, a new location, but very happy to be here. And uh, well, thanks again for the people of uh, Vredig to host us uh, today on Enterprise Grade EVM to um, Hyper Lecture Base. Huh? A lot of technical things and a lot of things. A uh, side event of the EPC, where we're finally going to speak about enterprise blockchain. Huh? So no crypto, guys, sorry. More about enterprise things, the real solutions. Okay, just a quick uh, overview. I'm Daniel Dussay. I'm a research coordinator at Hoewest. And at Hoewest, we are seeing beyond obstacles, oh, sorry, but uh, um, advertising, creating opportunities, developing talents, raising the bar, inspiring people to realize full potential, challenging people to do things differently. And that's what our focus is of University College of uh, of uh, Old West in uh, Bruges, but also in Kortrijk, and today exceptionally a bit in Brussels. And we are also a proud member, very proud member, of the Hyperledger Belgium uh, uh, group, and also a bit of facility. So this session is also in uh, looked in this opportunity. Yeah. I'm the research coordinator of one of the research units in uh, in Old West, Cyber Three Lab. And we very strongly focus on trying to see how small and medium companies, the SMEs, can use cutting edge technology. Because there's a heavy burden on using those kind of things by SMEs. Big companies normally have the access to those information, but if they want to use Web3, AI, cybersecurity, and immersive technology, it's very hard to do that. And that's also our focus of our group of 50 to 20 year researchers. Focusing on AI, immersive tech, cybersecurity, Web3, and also the combination of those kind of things. Huh? Because it's also very interesting to see what are the implications of cybersecurity for AI, what are the, the advantages for AI, the possibility that it offers for Web3. So that's also things that we actively research. Huh? To give you a search, uh, very uh, brief overview, that's some of the projects we are currently working in. We have a lot of European projects. The DEP um, project on FCNE, that's something I will come in the later sessions uh, in a moment, where we look at how we can be a node operator for the European blockchain service infrastructure. We have done the work on blockchain and government, the Blink project. Some project will start is the Excite. So how is the metaverse uh, giving advantages to the local governments? So the cityverse in that sense, so there's also a partner in that more on immersive tech and AI, uh, augmented reality. And we are also a partner in the big LSP project, the large scale pilot project of uh, the European Digital Identity Wallet. Uh, so a lot of things that we are trying to cover. Yeah. We don't only do research, we do also a lot of masterclasses. So if you're interested, in, uh, we have a masterclass basic web tree, masterclass secure web blockchain development and identity. So as a combination, University College, we also focus on those kind of things. Today, I'm also present. My colleague Patrick well, is also there, hobby, maybe we wait to the people. And we have also Shane the Corning and Wim uh, actively working on uh, those topics. So reach out uh, to them if you have any questions or anything that you want to uh, discuss. Uh, or we would also like to have a bit your um, your help because we are currently also trying to see uh, what is our position as a university college. And we are thinking, reflecting on, okay, is there a possibility, is there a need for blockchain certification? We have a million tons of uh, courses and um, uh, master classes, but maybe there is also an interest in to have some certification. Uh, really prove I am a competent architect, I am a, a member uh, of those kind of things. So, Please, um, we'll be handing over those kind of things and afterwards also giving you some, uh, uh, afterwards Patrick will send you those emails to invite you to a brief summary on uh, if, how you see the blockchain certification. Yeah? The same applies to uh, the, all the slides, so all the slides will be sent, but we ask you a small sur uh, survey to ask you what was your impression what did you go wrong? What did this uh, best way? So please give us some feedback on this. Yeah. Okay, the program. I'm on time, behind, uh, before time. That's also good. I only want five minutes. Overloaded program, but I think an interesting program. So the welcome is also already gone. And uh, then um, uh, Hart Montgomery will give you a brief uh, introduction to the new 
completely new. I think, uh, what is it, one week uh, hyperledger foundation? Or well, we haven't we haven't started yet. Okay, even <laughs> the <laughs> is brand brand new, even not yet started. So fresh, very fresh. Uh, then we have a session that we have a bit uh, comp uh, 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 combined in one, where the people of Kaleido will be talking about running hyperledger fees in the enterprise. And what's new, what's next? And combine also to a very practical uh, approach on the privacy for enterprise use cases. Yeah? So com a bit combined, but of course, uh, there's a lot of more information. Then we jump also into no uh, another session where we're going to have the, the merging the diamond proxy and the beacon proxy for upgradable size limit smart contracts. So that's something that uh, Alberto will share with us. Yeah? So very interesting, I presume of the technical session, but I don't think that's a problem for this audience. Then uh, I'm going to share something about the European um, uh, project, so the next generation of EPSI. How is the European Union and all the member states uh, reacting on blockchain and what is their ambitions? So also uh, 20 minutes for some Q&A. And then uh, our last speaker, uh, Mirja Ankel, will be going uh, to Alastair Red and the Public Permission Blockchain Consortium, also on Hyperledger Basic. Yeah. Uh, we foresee also that the talks will be 20 minutes. But of course, if you have any questions, we also foresee five minutes Q&A. But if you have an, uh, an urgent question, please let us know. We are not that big. We are expecting some more people, but please interact. Please have your thing. And at the end, of course, we would like to invite you to our network uh, approach and connect and stay a bit. Uh, we need to leave the building at nine, but maybe you need to leave the building for to watch uh, the football game. You know who is uh, playing against Spain with all the Spanish people in this already there. So at nine, we're going to close uh, the meeting. Uh, okay. I hope you enjoyed your evening, full loaded, full of information. But at the end, you will be rewarded by a small reception. Okay. The first speaker. Okay. Oh, you have also a Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I am Hart. I work as the CTO of the Hyperledger Foundation, and I'm going to give you a very brief overview of what Hyperledger is. Um, I just briefly want to say, as always, all are welcome. And uh, I'm required to show you this antitrust policy notice um, that goes along with all Linux Foundation participation. And we can move right through that. So what is Hyperledger? Hyperledger is an open source global ecosystem for enterprise-grade blockchain technologies uh, in critical implementations and developments around the world. So we're a part of the Linux Foundation. Um, are, are people here familiar with the Linux Foundation? Everybody familiar with, you know, the Linux kernel, Kubernetes, uh, automotive grade Linux, uh, Academy Software Foundation. That's a, a fun one if, if you're not familiar with it. Um, but as a sub-foundation of the Linux Foundation, uh, we enable developers, enterprises, or, and organizers to collaboratively develop uh, in the open. And we, of course, inherit all of the open source principles and transparency and open governance from the Linux Foundation. Um, and in summary, we believe that open source, open development, and open governance are the future of decentralized technologies. We don't believe in, say, you know, having centralized governance for decentralized software. It just doesn't inherently make sense. And when we see a lot of uh, projects that are ostensibly open source, we encourage you to ask if they're also openly governed. So what do we do as a foundation, as a staff? We serve as a neutral third-party home for code standards and sometimes even data collaborations uh, between different entities who may not fully trust one another. Uh, and we're backed by the most trusted legal framework, and we have a fantastic staff that have been working in open source for some time. So sort of the goal of Hyperledger and the Linux Foundation are 
if you want to collaborate on open development and you want others to use and contribute to your code base, uh, this is sort of the problem that we solve. Um, so, you know, these numbers aren't totally up to date, but we have a really massive effort worldwide. Um, and we've been doing blockchain since sort of the very beginning, and this doesn't have some of the most recent projects on it that we've got in 2024. Uh, but, you know, we've been doing open blockchain since almost anyone really. And what a lot of people don't know, and I apologize how this color is showing up on the screen, um, is Hyperledger has been involved with Ethereum for quite some time. I don't know, do people here remember Hyperledger Bro? Does anyone remember that? So that was a really cool project. Uh, it was, I think, actually too far ahead of its time. Uh, and that it was essentially a modular EVM that you could use with a number of different blockchains. Um, and you know that happened uh, all the way back in 2017. Um, but you know we've had a lot of collaboration and work with Ethereum and the Ethereum Foundation since then, uh, including the EA joining, uh, the EF joining, and of course, uh, as everyone will tell you today uh, about Beisu. Um, so very briefly, the goals for the meetup. I hope you all get to learn a lot about Beisu today. And importantly, I hope everyone can explore possible opportunities for collaboration. So how can you get what you want out of the community? Um, is, are people here on the Discord? So definitely, if you're not on the Discord, I encourage you to join. Uh, we have a lot of different ways to get involved if you're interested in the community or learning more. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. That's my five minutes. I'll turn it over to Matt. Um, and if you have any questions for me, I'll be around. So please feel free to ask. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Hart. Uh, okay, so I've got about 15 minutes, I think. Um, my name is Matthew Whitehead. I'm going to hand over to Jim Zane um, at about half past. Um, and I'm going to give an update on um, what's new um, and what's next in, in Hyperledger Besu for enterprise users. So just a bit about me. Um, I'm a Hyperledger Besu maintainer. Uh, so I'm a principal engineer at Kaleido. Um, and as you'll see on some of the subsequent slides, um, Kaleido and myself lead the enterprise roadmap for Vesu. So you'll see a lot of me on, on Discord um, discussing what well, we actually have now a, a, an enterprise specific channel on the, on the Vesu section of Discord where we talk about enterprise specific requirements and features. And I work very closely with the main um, open source project leads, largely from the consensus organization um, to shape. Um, where the public and the enterprise um, roadmaps are going, um, how they relate to each other, um, what we have in common, what things we're going to work on separately, and so on. Um, so Kaleido um, uh, is a Web3 technology company. Um, we, we do a whole, whole number of Web3 um, oriented technologies. Uh, we have an asset platform. But in this context, the, the and the most relevant things that we do specifically around Besu are we um, have a, um, a packaging of Besu, both for hosted and self-hosted environments, where we take given Besu releases, um, we uh, validate them, we add S-bonds to them, we test them uh, to a greater extent than the, the regular Besu releases are tested in the, the open source releases, um, and then we make those available as, as part of our offering. So, um, Collider has been heavily involved in Vesta, we've been running nodes um, on our platform for several years now. Um, and now, um, with our leadership of the, the enterprise roadmap for Vesta, we're kind of driving it um, even more forward. Um, I'm going to think I'm, I'm going to skip a few slides because I'm a little short of time. Um, I suspect most people here kind of um, have a good understanding for why Vesta is particularly good for um, the enterprise. It's, it's growth in the public chain, even though that's very public, public chain oriented, is a really good kind of part of that story for enterprises. It shows that it's being matured, it shows that it's being well used and exercised, and bugs are being ironed out by all the kind of home users and people running validators on mainnet. Um, and as that, as that ratio continues to grow, um, the combination of that with all the things that permission chains like, like QBFT, um, account permissioning, node permissioning, those sorts of features, 
Um, SME is a really good fit for, for enterprises. It also has a very permissive license, being actually two licensed, um, and so on. So I mentioned the BESI roadmap. Um, I'd encourage anyone here to go and look at the BESI roadmap. It's on the BESI wiki. And what we've done as part of having the public and the permissioned or enterprise-focused features being developed in parallel is we've separated out the, the roadmap so that you can see um, what are the things that are coming next for BESI, what's being worked on right now, what's work in progress, what's been implemented and released recently. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that the, the public and the enterprise roadmaps move along. And this is the part, the, um, the enterprise roadmap that, that I lead. Um, so I would also encourage you to come chat to me here on Discord, elsewhere, and talk to me about features you think um, BESI should be um, kind of delivering for enterprise use cases. So most of the rest of my talk is going to be a, a kind of a summary of what's been going on in BESI for enterprise over the last kind of 12 to 18 months. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to talk mainly about that slide on the right-hand side, talk about the things that are being actively worked on at the moment. But this hopefully gives you an idea for, I guess, the amount that's gone into BESU in the last kind of 12 months' worth of releases, um, why they've gone in, why they've been relevant features to, to be worked on. Um, I've got a slide. The main things are the, the two middle ones. They've got mostly interesting content that I'm going to talk to. So I've got about one slide for each of those, those items. Um, it's probably worth mentioning some of the stuff that was late last year. So um, we introduced a transaction pool that was much more focused on enterprise use cases. It was the evolution of what was the, the only pool, but the, the public main the public chain pool um, really really had different requirements to enterprises. So some of the kind of things that came in last year were the sequence transaction pool, which gives you much more FIFO-like behavior of the transaction pool. Transactions coming in are mined more or less in the order that they come in, which tends to be the order that people want in an enterprise and makes things like diagnosing things much easier. You don't have transactions stuck in it all, not knowing why they haven't been mined while other ones have gone ahead. Um, and a whole load of work was done, partly through the, the engagement of, of companies like Collido with a lot of production customers, ironing out issues you only hit at high performance, issues you only hit with stability when you're running for a long time, those sorts of things. But then um, some of the more kind of substantial work that, that we've done, um, I'd like to talk about now. So one of the first things that, that um, was delivered around the beginning of the year, the year was support for QBFT chains working with the Shanghai Fork. So for those of you who aren't familiar, the Shanghai Fork is an EIP of the, the public chain from about a, a year or more ago. Um, and it introduces several things which are public chain specific, but it also introduces an additional opcode to the EVM which improves the, the performance of certain transaction types. But, so there, there are two really good reasons why enterprises should care about some of the public EIPs. One is that those performance enhancements get, give you benefits to any transaction type, whether it's on the public chain or whether it's in a permission chain. But secondly, the ecosystem that developers are using in your application teams, they move along with the public chain. They're not hanging around um, kind of waiting two or three or four years old with your developers being totally happy to use old development tools, old versions of the compiler. Those development tools, those tool chains, they're moving on at the public chain speed. So what we started to see a lot of back end of last year and the beginning of this year was a lot of people saying, well, I'm using the latest version of Solidity against the QBFT chain and the, the, the contracts won't deploy. Or I'm using OpenZeppelin 5 against the QBFT chain, contracts don't deploy. Um, what the other gives. And the reason is that as those uh, compiler versions and libraries move along, they start by default using the latest features of the EVM. And at that point, that's it didn't support them if you're using a QBFT uh, consensus algorithm. Uh, so one thing that, that we worked on specifically was to make sure that the BESU for QBFT and IBFT chains was up to date with the latest forks and supported the Shanghai fork so that your development teams, your application teams, um, can use all these latest features like OpenZF and 5. Um, and that was released um, probably at the first quarter this year. Another thing we looked at was the fact that the defaults for BESU were just the defaults. And if you ran the defaults for BESU, you got a lot of stuff that was generally designed for running on a public chain. So we looked at how we could, how we could make it easy to run BESU for the enterprise. And, and the, the way that we've gone with that is that 
these are equal profiles. So we started with just two or three, one for like a public staking profile, which has some sensible defaults for that. One more public one, I forget exactly what, and then an enterprise profile. So the point of the enterprise profile is it gives you, for example, that sequence transaction pool I mentioned earlier by default. It gives you a minimum gas price of zero by default. Um, it sets a bunch of things around whether or not transactions should be prioritized if they go to a particular node. Most people don't want that, so that's turned off by default. And a whole number of other settings. You can still override them all. You can still take these defaults and tweak them and add your own. But the point is that if you set minus minus profile equals enterprise, you then get a much more sensible set of defaults for a permission chain. Um, another thing we added was that we saw that while BESU is generally pretty good, if you if you install an old version of BESU against your current data, generally speaking, that's safe. The feedback we were getting from enterprise users was, well, well, generally speaking, that safe is not really good enough. What we want to do is make sure that data is never corrupted if, for example, our GitOps pipeline goes wrong. And we pull the wrong version of BESU and we start it against existing data and it corrupts it. And we saw examples of this. Um, so one thing we did was, was make sure that by default, um, for the, the recent versions of ESU, it will also detect if you start at an earlier version and it won't start. So you can override it and say, no, no, I'm fine, I've checked the versions, it's fine. Um, or you create a new data directory and create a brand new node. But by default, it will, will fail to start and it's much more preferable to starting and corrupting your data. So we wanted to make sure that there was, a, there was kind of that behavior by default for enterprise users. And again, a lot of these features you don't find turned on by default for some of the public uh, settings. Then, um, most recently, this was delivered into the main line of, of BESU about a week ago um, by ourselves. And again, this is, this is sort of a bit of work which brings permission chains to parity with public chains. Um, but with the introduction of the Bonsai database, which is much better suited to pruning data over time, and gives you lower read times for state from the world state tree. And SnapSync, which gives you much faster sync times when you add a node into your network. Again, that's, that combination of QBFT and the Bonsai database and SnapSync had never really been invested in by the community. Um, you could turn them all on, and there was nothing that stopped you turning them all on, and it didn't really work. Um, and in fact, some work was done very early in the year to stop people actually starting if you turn them all on, because actually the community realized they just don't work. Um, now, Bonsai database has these, these benefits, and it's the future database for BESU. BESU will be removing the forest database at some point in the future, and Bonsai is the, the direction of travel for BESU. So it's really important that, that we at least start getting uh, good Bonsai support for permission chains. Likewise, SnapSync is going to be the way you sync anything that isn't kind of an archive node in the future. Fast sync, which is a bit like Kind of snap sync that's again going to be deprecated as BESU moves away from that, which was kind of a stop gap syncing protocol. So, snap sync makes it much quicker to sync a new node against a chain you've been running for five years that's millions of blocks deep. Um, and what we've done is make sure that the work has been done to ensure that you can now use QBFT with the Bonsai database with snap sync. And it all works out of the box. And that includes a kind of a whole number of edge cases that you wouldn't expect if you're a public chain user. A lot of the work we had to do was things like if you do snap sync against a chain and that chain hasn't got any accounts in it, no one invested with code for that case because everything's talking to the public chain, like millions of accounts. Lots of those edge cases I've started a new chain just to develop against. It's got no state. A lot of the snap sync didn't expect there to be no state, so it just didn't function. So there were whole whole kind of edge cases, loose ends to tie up, testing to add, that now means that you can use this combination, get much quicker sync times when you add nodes to your to your network, and you're now using all the technologies that BESU is, is kind of going in the direction of this, it's the kind of the strategic direction for BESU. Uh, just for the detail, um, how you turn some of these things on, you'll, you'll get these slides as, as they said afterwards. Um, but you, you have to turn on the SnapSync server on all the nodes that are going to serve SnapSync data. That's also experimental. And this, this feature, I should say, is marked as experimental just while we've let the dust settle and aren't out any bugs. Um, but this is how you turn it on. And you, you typically want to reduce the number of peers that, that the node expects, because again, on the public chain, you can find 25 peers very easily. So a default of five is fine. 
Um, but in some chains, if you're just running one node, two nodes, then typically you're going to reduce that number. And then um, one of the last things I'm going to talk about is that we spend a lot of time, we run nodes, we have customers running nodes through our um, self-hosted platform. Diagnosing issues in Vestu has not always been great, particularly around QBFT chains, particularly around when chains stall. And a lot of the cases were, were complicated to diagnose because not many people had kind of gone to the time to work out, well, what's, the, what, what's really going to help when I'm in this situation? And a really good example of that is a stall, a stall chain. So if you have four QBFT nodes, you always need three of those at any one time to keep producing blocks. And in the case where you go down to two, what you see is no new blocks are produced, no transactions can be mined. But in the logs, you see nothing, really. You see an absence of stuff. You see these blocks were produced, and then four minutes goes by while this situation was recovered. Nothing, nothing in there. You could turn on debug, you could turn on trace. You probably needed to do that on all the nodes, or at least some of them, to see whether they'd be talking to each other, which ones are offline. The QBFT protocol is quite complicated. It goes through this increasing rounds where all of the nodes have to get to the same round in order to agree on a new block. You don't get told any of that in a useful way. Um, and, and again, from, from the pain that we've seen customers experience diagnosing this, we, we looked at what can we do to make it much clearer what's going on in a network when this happens. So now, again, this was mentioned maybe about a week ago, what you see is the same situation, two nodes go offline, and then this actually pops out information about the QBFT logic so it says, well, this, this uh, node has now gone through QBFT round one, which has expired, and it's going to move on to round two. And it's going to tell you how long round two will take until it expires. But it's also going to log out the nodes it's talking to and which rounds those are at. And again, remember, they have to get to the same round for them to agree on a new block. So we can see that initially there were just two, two nodes all moving up through the rounds. And then the third node joins in, finally, someone's restarted the node, recovered the network, but it's back at round one, and that's how QBFT works. But from this one node, without turning on trace or, or debug, I can see over time how these new nodes, these nodes as they come back online, are converging on a round that means blocks are going to be produced again. You can see the top example, we've got a fourth node just joined in, that's great. So again, I can just look at the logs of this one node and see stuff is progressing. I don't need to go on to log on to other nodes. Um, to see what they're doing. I can see what they're doing from this one node. And now eventually they all reach an agreed round, round six. Hey, the next log is we're, we're producing blocks again. Um, so these kinds of things might seem kind of simple, but when it, when it comes to what's beneficial to enterprise users, and I skipped over the first slide about me, I spent nearly 20 years working for IBM on, on enterprise messaging. So I had a lot of experience of where, where a small amount of work can really make your life easier as an operator, as someone de debugging issues. Some of these, these areas really, really make your life easier. And then finally, just a quick update on performance. One thing we've heard from customers is, is what, what's best doing for performance. One thing that we've spent time on is looking at, well, what, what is the state of play for performance? And this paper from 2022, um, kind of came to the 400 TPS is achievable without too much work. Um, and so we, we looked at, well, is that still the case? Can it be tuned? Like, what, what are the limits? What are the bottlenecks? I haven't got time, obviously, here to go into loads of detail, and I'll do a little plug for a webinar I'll be doing in, in a couple of weeks. It does go into more detail. Um, but we did a lot of work to run test profiles of JVM to understand where the bottlenecks are to set tuning parameters. Um, and now we're, with, with, with just doing that work in a small amount of configuration, we're now easily able to hit kind of comfortably 50%, 60%, 70% higher numbers than that number from, from, from a couple of years ago. Um, and I think more performance work is gonna, is gonna come um, because we, we know there are other bottlenecks. Just the work on the bonsai DB alone added another kind of 80 TPS to our top line, just, just switching from, from Forest DB to to Monzo DB, and we think there's even more to come there. And we know there are other inefficiencies in the way that blocks are validated. So um, performance is something we've spent some time on, we plan to keep spending time on. So just last week before I hand over to Jim, what's going on next? Um, so the Bonsai DB work I mentioned is really, really a, a good start for enterprise vessel, but what it doesn't currently deliver is archive capabilities to say, Tell me about the state of this smart contract on block four, and I'm currently on block a million. 
Forest DB, if you ran that full sync mode, you could do that. Bonsai DB, you can't currently do that because what it inherently does is prune state. So over time, you lose that state and you have to look at other techniques to, to rebuild to a point in time. <clears throat> so what I'm actively working on, Collider is actively pushing as part of the Bessie roadmap, is uh, a way of retrieving archive data from a Bonsai database so that you can easily, as an enterprise, look at audit kind of information that you need from historic parts of the chain. Um, we'll also be looking at QBFT behavior. That, that logging I showed you was really useful in showing you how the chain was coming back up after an issue. But what it didn't do was make it quicker. It still took four minutes after you started two nodes for them to start producing logs again. And four minutes after you've restarted all your infrastructure to start doing something useful is not the norm for an enterprise environment. So I think we'll, we'll be looking at work there. Further performance enhancements, definitely. I think we'll be seeing more work there. Um, and so on. Um, that's pretty much it. Do come and join us on Discord. Find GitHub. Also, I'd make one shout out to the Benefit Financial Services Working Group, which meets every three weeks on a Friday or on Thursday, depending on which time zone you're in. I think Hart is probably the best person to get people in contact with that, or me, or yeah, we can find your links to, to join those calls hosted by DTCC, who are chairing that work. Okay. Um, thank you very much, and, and come and find me for questions later, I guess it would be best. <laughs> Hey everybody, uh, I'm Jim, uh, one of the co-founders of Kaleido um, and head of protocol at the company. Um, <clears throat> so today I'm going I'm to talk about um, the new project that we just contributed to Hyperledger Labs. It's part of a journey for us to do a uh, more significant contribution. Uh, as some of you may know, we are the creator of a Hyperledger project called Farfly, which is focused on the off-chain components to make uh, building blockchain-based uh, solutions easier to do. Uh, this is another significant uh, contribution we are planning to do, and Zito, uh, this project uh, as part of Hyperledger Labs, is the first step. Uh, and this is all focusing on privacy. Uh, as some of you have already been doing with um, uh, BES or even any EVM protocol, may know, uh, there's no built-in uh, uh, support for privacy. Uh, Tesra was an early attempt to have a privacy on, uh, uh, on ESU or other EVM protocols, but it's got its issues. Um, one of the biggest issues with the approach that Tesla does is you can't really run the token uh, design on this privacy model. So we need something more that <clears throat> works at the, uh, at the uh, EVM level uh, and gives you all the uh, abilities you need, uh, regardless of what kind of solutions you're building. Uh, specifically for tokens, uh, which is really hard to do because uh, by necessity, a token economy must uh, be fully decentralized so that the entire supply of the token must be seen by every node. But at the same time, you need to hide everything. So how, how do we do that? So that's what this project is uh, for. Uh, um, so as you can see, this was contributed to Hyperledger Labs already. Um, so if you are, uh, you know, after, after today, if you are uh, interested to give it a, a try, you can go there and uh, try out the tutorial yourself. <clears throat> so what exactly are we doing? Um, in terms of privacy, these are the fourth, uh, three things we need to achieve. Um, first, confidential, uh, confidentiality is about hiding things. So when you send transactions to the chain, you're not, you're not declaring, I'm sending a million dollars uh, to Matt. Right? That, that's how we do things today. Uh, we need to hide that. We also need to hide the, uh, the uh, ownership. So if people can see uh, that Jim is sending something to Matt, even though they can't see the, the amount, that's still not good for privacy purposes. And what's also very important is programmability. Uh, can 
we do other things on top of the privacy tokens? Can we do DVP from one token to another? That's very important for enterprise use cases. And finally, uh, we added this number four as part of this uh, project, which is uh, we need options, right? It's not like it's within the enterprise space, it's, it's never a one size fits all uh, situation. Uh, every use case has a bit of uh, different requirements on privacy. So we need pr um, privacy options. <clears throat> Before we get into exactly how Zeta works, uh, it's a, uh, we want to do a comparison between different approaches to building privacy uh, tokens. Uh, in general, you can build it in one of two ways. Either you can follow the current uh, ERC-20, ERC-721, which is account model. Uh, what's maintained on chain is, is a giant map, basically. You have account uh, addresses and you have balances. You can do this uh, with privacy by essentially um, um, encrypting the balance. So it's an encrypted balance rather than balance in the clear. And you can also, uh, using fancy cryptography, you can also do math on the cipher tags. So that's, um, that's all can be done. Uh, and if you have looked into this space, uh, existing solutions like anonymous Ether, uh, that's built on this model. Um, there is a rather ish a big issue with this uh, approach where, uh, if you are, multiple people are trying to sort of modify the same account, uh, you may never be able to spend uh, from your account. Why this is the case is, um, it, so anonymous Zether uh, is based on uh, generating a proof to show that I know my balance, you don't know it, and when I'm sending uh, some value to another person, uh, I'm proving that I have enough <clears throat> in my account to support that uh, transfer. Uh, and there's other things you need to prove, but this is very important to, to do, uh, and you need to do that in, in, in your own uh, program. Uh, the problem with this is if before your transaction gets uh, mined by the node, if someone else sends you even a penny, right, or a dollar, and that transaction gets uh, into the chain before your transaction, then your balance would have been uh, modified on the chain, which means the proof you just generated was going to be invalid. So you can't spend your money if somebody keeps sending you loads of one one cents to flood the chain. You will never be be able to spend. And there are certain things to uh, to make this work uh, by introducing this spending window. Uh, that does take care of the uh, spending issue, but it also limits you to. Uh, one spending transaction per uh, per spending window, which means uh, your throughput will be uh, will be limited. On the right hand side, uh, it's UTX. Well, okay, I flipped the order. On the left hand side is the, the other approach that we could uh, build a privacy token on, which is UTXO. And this is, uh, if you know how Bitcoin works, that's how Bitcoin uh, works. is built on UTXO, rather than just maintaining a, maintaining a table of account and balances, uh, all of our tokens are coins. You think of the token as a pile of coins. Every coin has a different denomination uh, to, to represent the value. And my balance is not just a single number. My balance is a collection of all the coins I own. <clears throat> Which means when I'm spending, it, I may have 10,000 uh, different coins uh, and with a total of $1 million, right? I can send all you know, 10, uh, 10 transactions together, each spending a different a part of my, um, my collection, and they're not gonna run, in, run into each other. And if others gave you more coins, then you just got, got more coins in your pocket, right? They're not gonna uh, uh, impact the transactions you're trying to uh, spend accordingly. So this approach gives us much better um, parallelism, so we can do uh, higher throughput uh, with this UTXO-based approach, and that's indeed how uh, we, we build Zito with. Um, um, some high-level constructs that we build Zito with, and I think I'm already out of, yeah, yeah, uh, out of time, minutes, unfortunately. Maybe uh, one or two minutes. Um, so the basic constructs of uh, UTXO, uh, 
with Zico is um, this is how UTXO works, right? So with Bitcoin, if you look at the ledger, it's just these collection of UTXOs. Every UTXO has a spending condition that basically says you have to prove that you are Alice by signing something. You have to prove you are Bob uh, so that you can spend these coins. And each represents a different value. So you can see the balance of Bob is if you add those two, which is 15.8, uh, and balance of Alice is 0.1. Obviously, for privacy purposes, we need to hide those, right? Nobody should uh, be able to see how much I have. So a great way of hiding things is doing a hash. So we're hashing all of these uh, values plus the public key of the owner plus a salt. So now uh, on the ledger uh, for the smart contract maintaining the, the tokens, all you see are a whole bunch of uh, uh, hashes. And hash is a great function because you can't work that to see what they represent. Um, so these achieved uh, confidentiality. Uh, now the problem is, when you send a transaction to a chain, you are, you, are spending, you are spending a bunch of hashes and you're producing a bunch of hashes. How would the uh, uh, smart contract know you, your transaction represents an honest transaction? How do you convince the smart contract? So that's where Zonage proof comes in. Uh, it's a very advanced cryptography approach uh, that we don't have time to uh, get into today. But understand that this is based on 40 years of research. Uh, and if you want to know how it works, you can talk to Mark. He's a <laughs> cryptographer uh, by trade uh, from Stanford. Um, so it, it basically, it, it's, um, it's a proof that shows to the smart contract that <clears throat> against those uh, hashes, you can be uh, you can be uh, certain that those hashes, hashes represent uh, a honest transaction, and that's guaranteed by math. Uh, so it's um, knowledge proof sounds uh, really complex, really fancy, but it's actually uh, a very mature uh, technology, and it's actually used in many many uh, Web three projects. So I don't have any time to go into the details of the circuit designs. Um, just to know that <clears throat> this is a toolkit that gives you a lot of uh, choices for different use cases. Uh, sometimes you want uh, on-chain encryption, uh, sometimes you don't. Uh, you may want uh, hiding the trading history, or you don't. Uh, so you can choose to use nullifier or not, no nullifiers. There's fungible token, non-fungible tokens, and there's also DBPs that can be built on, the, uh, on top of this in terms of pro uh, programmability. So I'll skip all of that and just leave you with this. Uh, all this information is in the repository. So you're welcome to either go to this uh, QR code or just go to Hyperledger Labs and find this info there. And if you have any questions or feedback, uh, welcome to call, come talk to us, where uh, we have our dedicated um, Discord channel uh, as well. Thank you. Are any questions? Okay. I'm well, that's okay. Uh, install itself. Are there any questions for Matt or uh, Jim? Are you enough to ask for a question? Don't mm -hmm. raise your hand. Okay. Now, reach out to them, uh, they will be here. So, next presentation. So my name is Alberto, I'm the innovation team lead at um, IO Business. Um, I joined my company a couple of years ago and the uh, blockchain industry for that matter. Uh, before that, I used to be a software developer for more than 10 years. Uh, so my presentation is going to be a little bit technical, but not too much, I promise. So we'll try to make it easy for you. Uh, let me please begin by um, introducing my company. So, uh, we are a Spanish uh, blockchain factory uh, founded in 2018, uh, specializing in enterprise solutions. Um, our team, made of architects, uh, blockchain specialists, uh, business and legal experts, 
uh, partners with companies to unlock their uh, potential in blockchain and DLT adoptions. Um, we have a, a business and regulatory compliance mindset. Uh, so we help our clients navigate the complex landscape of um, DLT technologies, and we also design our solutions uh, based on compliance. Uh, we collaborate with top tier uh, law firms and closely engage with regulators like the European ESMA and the Spanish uh, CNMP uh, to ensure the highest standards in our solutions. Um, innovation is embedded in our DNA uh, as we are constantly exploring new technologies to transform and evolve specific markets. And um, so finally, some numbers about the company. So we have uh, collaborated with more than 30 clients worldwide, uh, delivering more than 50 projects, and um, currently we employ around eight employees. Okay, so this is how I will structure uh, uh, my presentation today. So first, um, we will see what was a business requirement that we got. Um, after that, we will have a look at the um, things that uh, we can and we cannot do uh, within the EVM, so some restrictions it has, um, when it comes to deploying smart contracts. Um, then we will go through the uh, thinking process that we carry out to find the best solution, which was basically first we try to reuse the patterns that already exist. Um, and then we saw there was a reason why they didn't work for us, we present that. And finally, the most interesting part of the presentation will be the uh, pattern that we had to come up with in order to solve our uh, requirement. So, the business requirement. Um, so, uh, we received, like I said, business requirement, uh, which was to uh, deploy and manage um, independent equities and bonds on chain. Um, so, all equities would follow uh, the same business rules, and the same would happen for bonds. Um, so, technically speaking, uh, the requirement would translate to uh, deploying multiple independent items on chain with identical functionality. So, like clones of each other, many of them. Um, although, in our particular case, uh, the context was finance, uh, the same requirement could actually be applied to uh, multiple other domains, as, as you can see there. So, uh, for instance, in insurances, we could have like car insurances on the one hand and life insurances on the other. So all car insurances would work in the same way. Obviously, the data of the specific insurance would change from one to the other, but the behavior behind that insurance would be the same. Um, on real estate, you also have the same uh, situation, which is you can have state shares and loans. Again, they all behave the same way. They just It's just the data that changes from one to the other. So it's a very common business requirement that anybody working on blockchain at some point will have to face. Okay, so the business requirement was like our goal, and now, um, so the smart contract restriction was like the rules of the games that we have to respect in order to be able to uh, find a solution. Um, so the EVM imposes um, mainly a couple of restrictions uh, on the smart contracts. Uh, immutability, and maximum size. So first, uh, uh, let's talk about immutability. Uh, so once we deploy a smart contract, we cannot change its logic. Okay, this is to ensure, obviously, security, uh, but it also means that we cannot fix errors or extend uh, the functionality of the contract. Um, so upgrading smart contracts is difficult, and so to upgrade the contract, we need to deploy a new one, um, as you can see here, the second one below, and then migrate all the data from the first one to the second one. Um, so this means that all users that are using, that are interacting with those smart contracts, we have to update the smart contract address uh, they, they are interacting with, and also uh, the data migration from contract one to contract two uh, will probably require multiple transactions, which means a lot of time and a lot of transaction fees. Um, and then regarding the second restriction, the size limit, um, so smart contracts cannot be larger than 24 kilobytes. Um, so if we need to deploy business logic that takes more than that, uh, which is normally the case, 
uh, we need to deploy multiple smart contracts. Okay, which means that the user that is interacting with our system will need to store multiple smart contract addresses, not just one. And to make matters worse, um, if we need to upgrade several smart contracts, uh, users will have to follow through and update their respective addresses as well. Um, so as you can see, it's very, very annoying uh, to migrate from one contract to the other uh, in that way. Um, so in order to implement the equities and the bonds that we were asked to, uh, we will need to deploy business logics that were more than 24 kilobytes again, and they should be upgradable for obvious reasons. Because if you deploy code and you just forget about it, that's how you're going to have some uh, problems. Okay, so the initial approach we had was uh, let's use the patterns and the solutions that already exist in the market, in the industry, and let's try to see if we can solve that. So the first pattern is a very old one, let's say, and very uh, well known, um, which is the proxy pattern. Um, which so uh, regarding the immutability constraint, uh, this uh, solution is very well known in the ecosystem. Uh, it is defined by the EIB in 1967. Okay, that doesn't really matter. Uh, so the way it works is um, we deploy a proxy contract, which is the blue one you can see there, uh, which is basically a smart contract with almost no logic, okay? The only thing you can do, that blue smart contract, is when receiving an external call from a user, it, it delegates its execution to another smart contract, okay? Which is the implementation smart contract, the one in red. Um, so that implementation smart contract is the one that contains the actual business logic, okay? So by doing so, the proxy is kind of borrowing the implementation contract, uh, the implementation contract logic, and executing it in its own context, okay? So which means that the storage used for the variables will be the proxy's one, okay? So to make it simple, we are kind of decoupling the data from the logic, okay? That delegation functionality is something that the EVM offers, and is actually very powerful. Um, so the big advantage of this pattern uh, is that um, if we need to upgrade the business logic, we simply have to deploy a new implementation, okay, the implementation, the second one right there, and then we just go to the proxy and we make the proxy point to the second implementation we just deployed, which is going to be completely transparent to the user because the user, the user only knows about the proxy's existence so we we'll keep interacting with the proxy. The proxy behind the scenes now is delegating to a different smart contract that has a different business logic, which is basically fixing bugs or extending functionality, whatever. And all of a sudden, we have upgraded our contract logic without the user knowing that we have done it. Um, so the two big advantages of doing that is that we don't need to migrate any data anymore because the data is stored in the proxy and the proxy doesn't change. Um, also, the users don't need to upgrade or change the address of the contract they are using because they will continue to interact with the proxy. They don't care about the implementations of the contracts that are deployed behind the scenes. But however, if our logic is more than 24 kilobytes, uh, we still need multiple contracts. So this pattern doesn't completely solve our, our need. So there is another pattern now, um, the EAP2535, which is the diagonal pattern, um, which is also very well known, and um, its purpose is to help with the second constraint that I mentioned at the beginning, um, the, the maximum size limit. Uh, so if you have understood the proxy uh, pattern that I presented before, this one is kind of an extension of this one, of the, of the first one. Um, so the way this pattern works is um, we deploy a diamond contract, which is again, it's just like a proxy. It's a smart contract with its own storage. Um, it delegates its execution to um, an implementation smart contract. But the big difference here uh, between a diamond and a regular proxy that I was uh, showing before is that diamonds can delegate to different implementation contracts called facets, okay, that's the technical term, as you can see there, we don't call them implementation smart contracts anymore, we call them facets, like 
the diamond as a facet, um, depending on the incoming call. Okay. So a, a simple example to illustrate it would be, would be um, a user invokes um, selector A on the diamond, um, and the selector is like the method ID. So when a user is uh, interacting with a diamond, it is calling a specific method. That method has an ID, and in the blockchain world, we call that a selector. Okay. Uh, and then the diamond delegates uh, the execution to facet A. Okay, in this case, selector A. Um, the delegation will be done to facet A. Okay? If the user uh, invokes selector C, then the delegation will be done to facet B, as you can see there. So now we are delegating to multiple smart contracts, not just one. So all of a sudden we have, uh, we don't have, uh, we have to bypass that restriction of 24 kilobytes. Okay? Um, so we are kind of encapsulating in a single diamond contract uh, an unlimited amount of business logic. Okay, way beyond those 24 kilobytes restriction. And uh, when we need to upgrade some business logic, uh, we will proceed just like for the proxies. So we will change the facets contract address uh, within the diamond, and we are good to go. So we deploy facet A2, and we just go to the diamond, we upgrade the address of facet A, and that's it, completely transparent to the user. So as a consequence of this, uh, the users do not need to store multiple addresses anymore. They just need to store the address of the diamond and all of a sudden they have access to an unlimited amount of business logic. And whenever anything is upgraded, the user is completely transparent to me. Okay. So if we dive in a little bit more into the inner workings of the diamond, um, so like I said before, the diamond is like a proxy because it delegates execution uh, but it contains kind of a mapping table, okay? That maps input selectors to output facets, okay? And some logic related to the mapping table. So we have, it is actually divided in, in two different functionalities, the loop and the cut. So the loop functionality is all the code uh, required to match a selector of an incoming request with its corresponding facet contract address, okay? So once the facet is determined, the, uh, dale the um, diamond delegates to that facet. The cut functionality, the one in red here, um, is all the code that is required to manage the mapping table, like adding new selectors, new facets, so it's a functionality that we use when we are upgrading the, the diamond. Okay, so obviously the uh, loop functionality is normally open to everybody, it's public, anybody can access it, whereas the cut functionality is, is protected. It's available only to authorized people because they can change the business logic behind the smart contracts. Okay, so all that is, so the two patterns that I presented so far, they are very interesting. They help us uh, bypass the two restrictions that I presented at the beginning, which was uh, the immutability and the size limit. Um, but there is a new issue that, another issue, sorry, that I didn't mention so far, um, which is that what do we do when we have multiple clones? So, so far I've been talking about just one proxy with its implementation of one, one diamond with multiple facets. But our business requirement, if you uh, remember, was deploying multiple equities on bonds. And in this scenario, one equity would correspond to one diamond. So if we are deploying thousands of equities, we will deploy thousands of diamonds. And uh, if we need to upgrade them, it will require thousands of transactions, which is obviously not doable. Okay? So there are actually a bunch of um, problems with that. Um, like for instance, there will be a higher maintenance cost because upgrading the proxies one by one, like I said, means submitting a transaction for each of them, uh, which leads to paying multiple times the transaction fees. Um, there is also a lack of consistency risk uh, because without a unified pattern, ensuring consistent behavior uh, and updates across all contracts uh, becomes challenging. So it could happen that we forget or, or fail to update some proxies, in which case we will have a few hundred proxies updated and the others would not be updated, and that can be a problem. 
Uh, another disadvantage will be the increased deployment cost. So if each proxy or, or diamond is individually upgradable, then each proxy or diamond must contain its own upgrade logic, which means that their bytecode will be larger and thus more expensive to deploy. There can also be some <coughs> synchronization challenges. So since each item is upgraded individually uh, until the whole process is done, some of them will still point to the old implementation contract, uh, which leads to lack of synchronization. There is also a reduced transparency. So prox some proxies can be pointing to so different implementations at a given time. So users and developers will have a, a hard time uh, keeping track of their current version. And finally, I mean, governance complication, uh, obviously, so coordinating the governance and decision-making across numerous contracts can be cumbersome and inefficient. So that's a problem. It's not a problem, I repeat, it's not a problem because of the EVM, but because of the business requirement that we have. So there is another pattern called the beacon pattern that also is commonly used, and its purpose is to solve this global issue that I just presented, okay? So uh, the way it works is a um, smart contract called the beacon, the green over there, is deployed. And the purpose of this beacon is to store the address of the implementation proxy, uh, that, that's how the implementation contract that proxies will delegate to. Okay, so all proxies now point to the beacon instead of pointing to the implementation contract directly. And uh, whenever a proxy receives an incoming call, it will ask the Bitcoin contract what is the address of the implementation contract that it has to delegate to. Okay, so by doing so, upgrading multiple proxies is now as simple as upgrading the pro the Bitcoin proxy, the Bitcoin contract, sorry, itself. And all of a sudden, those unlimited number of proxies will be uh, upgraded. Um, so. That beacon pattern is useful for proxies, but it didn't exist. So the same thing for diamonds doesn't exist, didn't exist. So we had to kind of come up with that um, solution ourselves. And we called it the resolver pattern. And as you can see, it's very, very similar to the beacon one. So, so again, so just following that beacon approach, um, which again, it applies only to regular proxies. Uh, we came up with that with this solution with this with the resolver pattern. So the way it works is um, a contract called the resolver is deployed, and all, all diamonds point to it. And uh, when they receive an incoming call, they will ask the resolver what is the facet uh, that must be used for that specific selector. Um, the resolver then returns the facet address, and the diamond delegates to it. So again. The, very, the, the same thing that uh, we do with with, with beacons. Um, but the main difference with the beacon pattern is that resolvers will return a different address depending on the selector they get as an argument. Okay? And now just that, so let's look a bit more in detail uh, what the resolver contains. So it is basically the same logic that a regular diamond has um, so again, the demo loop logic that returns the facet address for a specific selector. Um, that, that's the method uh, that diamonds will invoke when they receive an incoming call, and the resolver will look for the facet address in the mapping table, return it, uh, then the diamond will uh, delegate to it, which is the fifth step. Um, so as you can see, in a nutshell, uh, what we have done is extract all the diamond related functionality from the diamonds themselves and put it in the resolver and make it accessible for all those smart contracts. And that's pretty much it. I think right on time, right? On okay, time. So do you have any questions? What is the status of this solution? Has it already been used and tested? Yes, or? we have already used it and deployed on a hypermetric test uh, network and also on a different EVM compatible network called Hedera, because this solution applies to all EVM uh, launches. So yes, we have already tested it and used it. It has also been audited, because it was part of one project, and the whole project was audited, so this solution was also part of it. 
And <laughs> yeah, that's it. So in a couple of places, you know, using it. Yeah. I was a bit late to the show, so sorry if my question was already answered before. Um, but doesn't this centralize quite a lot in an usually decentralized solution? Completely. Yes, yes, that's basically what we're doing. So this solution, the, here you can see the site, the resolver is centralizing that, yes. So obviously, I mean, there is some risks if the person in control, so the person that has access to the diamond cap functionality over here, that admin is in full control of uh, the business logic behind all the diamonds. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, all those diamonds, they, so this functionality, this diamond cat functionality is also part of the diamonds, even if you deploy them individually. So that admin of that diamond will also be in control of the business logic behind that. So there will also always be someone in control of the, the, the business logic behind the diamond contract. The only difference here is that is one admin. When I say one admin, it can be actually five of them. You know, you can say you can use a multi sig uh, account for that. Uh, but by centralizing it in one single place, the big advantage is that with one transaction, you upgrade all of them. And the benefits are way more uh, larger, let's say, bigger than the uh, disadvantages. The question? Okay. okay, maybe on the lighter side of the story, less uh, technical uh, presentations or kind of these. Uh, I want to discuss a bit what is Europe doing? What is the European Commission with all the member states and the public sector doing in this space? And what are we doing with Hyperledger Basic? So I want to present to you European, and that's the European Digital Infrastructure Consortium also known as EPSI, or the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure, where I'm also the Belgian representative. So next to my job in the West, I'm also there, the Belgian representative, and also involved in lots of projects related with EPSI. Now, if you look at what Europe wants to do, Europe has lost a lot of battles, has lost a lot of uh, things about technology, if you compare it to the US, and they don't want to make the same mistake. Eh? And they have identified some cutting edge technologies that are also the base for the new digital society of tomorrow. You see quantum, you see microcomputing, you see 5G, and they also identified blockchain as one of the key technologies that will be the fundamental of other things. Because in that new digital society, the rules will be different. The rules will be about data spaces, about security. So that layer, is on top of those cutting edge technologies. And on top of that, we can also try to see how we can implement democracy. Because in that new digital society, things like participation, sustainability needs to build on top. So it's not only a technical question. We have seen a lot of technology, but those technologies serve a higher good. And that's also what is Europe, and also with the allied states in the world with the same principle are trying to achieve. So keep that in mind that this is also the plan of Europe towards the new digital decade. It's not only technical guys doing things, it is a higher perspective. As already mentioned, so blockchain is one of those key technologies, which has of course had its struggle, very much high in 2017, uh, then going back up, but Europe still believes in that. And they want to see that this is also a multi-country project because Europe at the very heart is decentralized. You cannot have one centralized solution ruling all. You have a complex ecosystem with a lot of member states, a lot of organization, public, private, society. So by default, you need to think on the decentralized way. And that's also why this technology is very useful and now why they want to invest in those kinds. Now, a bit into contradiction, what Hart is, uh, what mentioned is indeed ask your question if you want to implement something decentralized, is there also a decentralized governance model? Yeah? In Europe, you have a bit of problem that if you want to implement something in production, you need to have something that is liable, which is the organization that's liable for those kind of things. And in Europe, we don't have a real answer in those kind of things. So they created something new and they called it a bit the digital, uh, European Digital Infrastructure Consortium is to try to see if you have those decentralized infrastructure, who's going to manage it? Because it's not one member state that will them all, 
It is a bunch of member states, but they still need an organization to have those decentralized governance plays in Rome. Yeah? So it's a bit in contradiction, but to be liable to do those kind of things, you also need that. Right? But of course, not something, no one organization that's on top of it. It's a decentralized organization. Yeah? So that is important. And a bit about the pride in this and kind of thing. Belgium also took a bit the initiative to try to see, okay, the things that we are working on blockchain with different member states, let's try to organize it and create a public sector blockchain. Yeah. Now, the people of the conference uh, a couple of months ago would kill me to say, okay, we need the permission to apply the blockchain and it needs to be public sector uh, driven. But this also try to see how we can uh, try to transform the public services in the using those kind of technology. Yeah. And of course, this European initiative will not be the only blockchain that will exist. Yeah. But this is a gateway to let the member states, public services, enter the Web3 spaces yeah. and then secure a bit of way and also a bit of controlled way. Yeah. Ten countries have engaged to form that new European digital infrastructure, what we have called a European, except see, as you see, there's different countries, and those are the, the first ten. We need to evolve to more, 34 and so on, 27, but to see that every country in Europe is a part of that new organization. There's already a lot of countries that also want to participate. We have also requests today from Canada, from Ukraine, also, also Taiwan, and also the natural states that are a bit uh, in the lines. But to see, can we build this thing together and also govern this thing together? Now, the philosophy of this uh, project is to see it's about decentralization. Yeah? So we want to add, of course, added value. We see that the world is more getting more and more complex. So you need even in public sector, in public services, new solutions. Yeah? We, the things that we have built today with uh, registries, with services, it doesn't work anymore yeah? because you need to have scalable. It's getting more and more complex with more and more interactions. Yeah? So we think that this technology needs to be embraced by the public sector so that uh, we have the best technology. And to be issued it with, I, of course, not have any personal risk in this kind of thing. And that's also why this hasn't been implemented. Yeah. So the project also relies, of course, on uh, a good stable uh, infrastructure. And we have created this infrastructure based on how to let you be easy. Now, it is, why, what is it providing? is a multi-domain trust infrastructure. Huh? Providing between the actors that are equal, that are not uh, aligned to each other, that have no hierarchy, but want to share things. Huh? So we want to have transparency in all what we do on public sector, and of course <laughs> some of the most interesting aspects. And we want to provide data spaces also. Huh? The information that we share, how can we put that also in new technology, not in having satellite silos, but also providing data spaces on valuable information that can be shared. And of course, very important, and is also the reason why we implemented our own infrastructure, is that we need to comply with EU values and regulations. And that also needs to be controlled. And we come into that in a moment, but GDPR, AI does, all those kind of regulation, also the other ones that are coming uh, more and more on data spaces and all those kind of things, are the very heart of this. And that, of course, there's a real reason why this uh, section of people, the government uh, aspect, public sector, wanted to create a new infrastructure based on their rules, based on their governance model. Yeah. But of course, serving the public sector. Now, what is our uh, overall architecture? Very easy in that sense. Uh, the EPC ledger or the area ledger base implementation is the foundation and the base of everything. And build on that. We try to have specifications and try to have frameworks like here, the verified credentials profile that we try to, uh, I try to define and try to agree on. Because that is the most difficult part. You can have an infrastructure, but you need to agree on technical and functional level. How do you deal with those kind of things? Yeah. What kind of technical standards do you follow? Yeah. What we don't do, because it's not uh, our job, and we look at it in the private sector, is the wallet and all the applications that are provided for business users. And so it wants to be the road, but the, the, all the traffic, all the things, the, the, the cars and all those kind of things are something that we expect from the private sector. 
Yeah. So that's also a, a lot of conversation, a lot of discussion. Yeah. We don't want to provide an end-to-end -end solution. It's something in layer, a public good that can be used by other people. Classical example of the decentralized identity aspects where we have issues and verifies. And in that sense, we try to see that the public services can act as issuers, so provide all the government documents to us at the, uh, to provide the citizens and the holders, but provide also mean so that the, those issue documents can be easily verified without going into the um, uh, checking by the verifying by the issuer. Uh, so blockchain plays here a small role, yeah, but an essential role. Yeah? And, all going back. and this kind of model also inspired, it is also important, the AI does a regulation. So the European Digital Identity Wallet uh, was a classical solution, state governed, state driven. If you try to implement it in a way that it's getting inspired by these set concepts. Uh, that's also the reason why we do that. Not only the UDI that's inspired in this, the digital product password, the other big project, flag package project, is also getting inspired by the decentralized concepts, by the Web3 kind of thing. Uh, you see a, a movement in Europe, slowly but steadily. That's embracing the decentralized technology concepts. So, as mentioned, I, we need to have uh, alignment with the regulations of Europe. So, also AI does and UDI also a place in this kind of thing. Huh? That sounds easy, but it's not easy huh? because you have to comply to a lot of regulations. This Europe, uh, as you know, uh, Europe puts a lot of weight on the regulation. We need to, need to comply, okay. How, what does this mean? Huh? What does it mean for our infrastructure to be legally compliant, to be GDPR approved, to be EI does approved, all those kind of things. So a lot of regulation that we need to take into consideration in our governance model. Huh? The project itself is something that evolved from the commission, is now transferred to the member states, but it's supported by a lot of projects that are trying to deploy a lot of service and, and deploy capabilities. Huh? So the digital Europe, program, so a funding program, is also try to see, okay, can we have multiple projects that develop uh, in uh, business cases or develop capabilities or deploy certain activities. So we need to see this as not a project, it's a multitude of projects that are related. The most important one are the currently the large-scale pilots for the for the decentralized identity or UDI to be clear, that is the European Digital Wallet Consortium and the Digital Credential for Europe. And they want to implement the decentralized identity related with the European MEPSI into the new wallets that Europe will provide. But a lot of other projects, like our MEPSI Vector, MEPSI NE, and MEPSI Trace, is trying to develop more and more. And that's multi million uh, projects, try to deploy it, try to have more uh, power into this aspect. Now, next to those big projects, we see that there's a lot of attention into the market, trying to see, okay, how can we use it for our specific use cases? So those are plus 25 projects, mostly on a verification of documents, because that was on the most I, uh, first uh, use case, but also on traceability, verification of products, and verification of legal entities. Again, this is not the ambition to be the only blockchain or the only ledger, but all things that are related with public sector have a place here, a neutral place to deploy it and to be used by a broader audience of products. So uh, we see also a lot of wallet providers that are looking, okay, can we link it to uh, EPSI? Can we link it to Alastair, what comes in a moment? Link it to ID Union? So there's a multitude to, of those kind of things. And also link it, of course, to the public, uh, public chain. Uh, and we try to see that it's easy access on the public sector. On a general level, but I'm not a technical guy, I, a classical, I think, hopefully classical, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but it's of course an hyperledger basic uh, architecture where we have an infrastructure layer, but also nodes and also external capabilities that needs to be deployed. Yeah? So at the very heart, I, I tried also to be very active in the hyperledger basic um, community, try to see how we can deploy this. But we see this also as a big deployment and try to look at what kind of components do we need in that aspect. Now, what is a network today? So we have that uh, European Commission Infrastructure for Operation, oh. in, the, uh, in Amazon, but try to see. But of course, uh, we are mainly looking at 
uh, three private uh, environments, three public environments, where we have deployment tests and pilot production and production grade. Yeah, so a lot of uh, instantiations are going. Now we evolve from in the pilot network because we have a lot of testing. And it's also hard to go to production, not on a technical level, only on a legal level. So gradually we go into production, but also we need the editing to do that. Yeah? Now, of course, this is only the beginning eh, because uh, little things like that activity has been done. But if you go, it's currently also going to 5 million euro, uh, 30 million, uh, million of the citizens that will be using uh, potentially this uh, application. Now, what is uh, the live maps? This is your geographic application. You'll see OS, the, the first one. Um, we also have a node provider. Uh, it is a limited. It's not like Ethereum that everybody can host a node. It's again in our government's model that public uh, um, service countries endorse the application of the node. Huh? But they do that together. And we hope to see a very diverse uh, ge uh, geographic dispersion all over Europe. Huh? It's not that we need thousands of nodes, huh? although again, uh, happy to, uh, thanks to the hyperventure basin, but this is a controlled way huh? in that sense. Yeah. Of course, I, we are looking at public services, we are looking at sensitive information or potentially sensitive information that is about social security and about education, not that we put information on chain, but of course it needs to be secure, yeah? because you're testing things, you're uh, presenting information, you need to be sure. Yeah? So the security framework, there's a lot of work that has been done, but to see how we deal with that. That's not specific hyperledger data, but you need to keep that in mind, try to see that those kind of things. Yeah? So a lot of uh, people, a uh, big part of those uh, of our, our resources are going into cyber security and security aspects. Yeah? Already mentioned, so we follow up uh, very closely what is happening in the uh, in the hyperledger base foundation. So we I recently switched to that new protocol, which I already met you has mentioned. I is also something that is also very interesting for us. We like to see that this uh, hyperledger base is moving and we try to find a way to uh, keep track of it and to implement the latest two things uh, because it's also needed also on security level. Huh? Now, a bit in contradiction what I mentioned, uh, Europe is, uh, uh, the energy network is mainly focusing on hyperledger base uh, because the most use cases are deployed on that technology. We did some experimentation with hyperledger fabric but we realize that it's very difficult to deploy that in a larger scale. Yeah? It's very cumbersome. It's very nice to do that if you are the sole controller, but it's a nightmare if you deploy that in a multiple uh, way. Yeah? So that is something that we see. From in Europe, there was also the, the idea to say, okay, hyperledger base is nice for this kind of generation of, uh, of um, uh, capabilities and use cases. But what for the next things? What if we have millions of transactions, millions of things, high volume, high scalability? So they try to explore also in a pre-commercial procurement, what could be the next generation? Yeah? And there, based on that, with uh, all those things, we try to explore what IOTA could offer, what Comoway, what Dillion, they try to do, create a new protocol. Yeah? But that's, uh, to be honest, at the current moment, we don't see use cases that really need something else. Huh? We are very happy with Resu, with all the things that are looking, also the work that has been done on tokens. So currently we're a bit sticking in those kind of things, but we are looking at maybe some potential use cases will require other protocols. Huh? So our network is by default, not by default, but uh, potentially multi-protocol uh, issued. But of course, I do end this a bit uh, brief presentation, brief overview. I, we have a lot of uh, technical information, of course, on our website. Also, mainly looking at okay, what kind of use cases because that is the most work. Eighty percent, ninety percent is working on use cases. Technical infrastructure is nice, but you need to put a lot of work. And that's also why we need to reach out to a lot of partners, where technical partners, but also business partners. Yeah. So we see a lot of interest. Uh, over carbon credits towards uh, credential sharing or not notarization of things, but of course always in collaboration. Yeah? And what is also needed and always in the, the main reflection is what is the role of the public sector in this? Yeah? Is it something that we need to govern or is it something a society will do or private sector? Yeah? It's always a very difficult balance that we need to do. Yeah? 
and of course they're related to other bigger European projects where we can serve that. And so we see ourselves also to say, for decentralized identity or for the digital identity in Europe, for digital products can be implement already something of the Web3 kind of focus. Right? So this also we see our task to uh, try to motivate them in that sense. Okay, this was a bit uh, my presentation on European, so I don't know if you have any questions, so a bit less technical than that. Yeah. Okay. So, maybe I misunderstood you, but the idea is that all those public services are implemented by private companies? But we deploy the infrastructure, but the linking towards the infrastructure needs to be by private sector. Right? The, the enterprise wallet, like we call it, or the interface to the links, is something that we will rely on private sector. Okay, so yes, we only build the infrastructure over the first layer. So it also gives possibilities to the solutions providers that need to build something. Quick question. Well, uh, I saw you, you saw, uh, you said one of the QBFT advantages is to can scale to 120 val validators. Is the idea that every country will be a validator? No, not every country will be validated. I have not slide on those kind of things. If you have a bit of complex, uh, I try to, I also better with uh, uh, like basic people, try to see, okay, how many validators do we need? How many normal nodes? How many pilot nodes? And those kind of things. Yeah? So I thought uh, we needed some, yeah, 120 will never need. I think with 15 or 20 no, uh, validators, we have enough. Uh, those kind of things. Because also, I. It is not something that we need to have in a proof of work kind of things. I, uh, and then an issue, issue something and the proof of authority is there. Yeah? So nobody needs to really validate it in that sense. Also. The question over there. Two questions over there, actually. It's just an opinion, but I believe that. Um, the wallet part should be um, considered infrastructure because as you see where things are going, um, nowadays people build uh, like apps on MetaMask and so forth, so basically applications on top of wallets yeah. and wallets become infrastructure with all the financial details but also all the private details and so it, uh, it's possible then to make applications that are natively uh, GDPR compliant or whatever compliant. Um, and at least everyone would have like, uh, yeah, some wide infrastructure to develop. So I think that's something that should be taken up by the private sector, or at least by the uh, public. Yeah, indeed. And that's something that big discussion and reflection where do you put that perspective? The only thing is that we wanted to decouple that is to say, it's not our responsibility, we are not in control of those kind of things. But you need to have indeed ways to do those kind of things. Huh? So. Hey, it's a difficult discussion, but uh, you want to put Because the, the, the wallet is also digital identity, it's passwords, it's all those things. So if you really want to own that in Indeed, but that's, that comes indeed to a bit of difficult uh, discussion that we have today with our colleagues of the European Digital Identity Wallet, because they see it slightly different. They see something that is issued by the member states and hard linked with your base identity. So you have a Belgian wallet with your Belgian identity and it's linked together. So they can revoke it, they can take it. And that's not the model that we want to do, those kind of things. So it is a hard discussion at this moment. We are a bit in hybrid status at this moment. They are using decentralized things, but also using a lot of centralized components. So we hope to see that in the evolved way. But there's also a bit of discussion, who will be the wallet provider? You are need to say, okay, you need an infrastructure. Is also claimed by society, or do we see providers banking uh, offering of wallets? Eh? It's not clear what kind of uh, go I can go in the wrong direction or the right direction. I'm not saying what is the wrong or the right direction in that sense, but it is a risk. I could have made a question how much do you actually weigh on the decision process in the AU? In the EU, if you look at AI, does for example, yeah. like with the identity drive. <laughs> A lot of options, digital product passport. I heard the commission say it's going to be a decentralized solution, but they don't say it's going to be built on blockchain infrastructure. No. Do you expect to see that happen anytime? 
that they will make clear choice because it will still make it much easier to actually do something on blockchain. The problem is that the commission and the product sector will want to be neutral in every way. They want to stay virgin technology by default, by ever. So they will never choose anything. And that's very hard uh, to say, okay, you need to have those kind of solutions because say, no, no, we need to be neutral in those kind of things. Uh, that is difficult. On the other hand, I, I see that a lot of decentralized concepts are already in that kind of thing. You will never have a digital product password without a decentralized approach. Yeah? The, the, the European Digital Identity Wallet, if you look at the political matches, it's also about decentralization. But how you will implement it, you will have a constant struggle in those kind of things. Right? <coughs> Nobody is saying to say, okay, it's already centralized. There are different forces. Are we already happy that they are seeing this as a hybrid wallet? That's a, 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 the first victory. But I think they will struggle with their kind of things into I, in the next five years. That people don't have privacy, that is controlled, that you have risk. So I hope that they set uh, directly also the step towards those kind of things. That's not something that I, it's also very difficult. Huh? You have policy decision makers that don't understand the consequences of certain technology going choices. Huh? So there's also, very, you see that the IDAS uh, working group is a very, very technical group. Huh? And even the policy makers that don't understand, they don't understand what, they, what are the things that they say. And you see a lot of lobbyists and, and that kind of things. Huh? No. Okay. Yeah, you are in, uh, um, in the last, uh, amendment, amendment of the yeah, IDAS 2 was introduced to specifically qualify electronic ledgers. So, as I mentioned, probably no regulator, no legislator want to be attached to a specific, um, you know, technology, but yeah, as we know, that implies blockchain. In yeah, but if you have a bit history, it was first written. Then we moved and then we and then and then yeah, yeah, okay. that's one. So that took a lot of work yeah. because they want to say, no, we're not writing anything about technology. That's a specific solution. And you mentioned, no, this is not a specific, this is a complete other approach that you are putting. Yeah. So luckily, I, there is also included, but this is a constant struggle in that sense. Because I do all the respect, they always make the connotation blockchain is crypto, crypto is bad, yeah. crypto is scammy. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes also, it's also why we mentioned decentralized identity and not blockchain technology. Yeah, sorry, guys, <laughs> That's a, that is a bit the reality that we face. Huh? Next speaker. Okay, thank you very much. So I vote for you. We can keep on discussing this during the networking drink and bring uh, a food that's coming. <laughs> After Miguel Angel's so hello I'm I, yeah I'm Miguel Calero okay I'm Miguel Calero I'm the lead of emerging technologies at the 30s that is the company I work for but also board member of Alastria right now I'm here with the Astria hub um, um, yeah I'm board member of Alastria because I'm Okay. Uh, also, I've been a um, civil entrepreneur, I've, been, I've started five times uh, companies, then I have one exit, and yeah, and I have, yeah, you have my handle, is uh, a handle for Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, any other social network. I have enough, I mean, I have all to, to choose my, my username and, and then my email address okay um in this we are uh, almost two thousand people company uh, really growing fast and and public company so you can see all our figures and and the marine technologies group that, that i lead we build digital products 
uh, with emerging technologies that meaning blockchain, AI, and quantum. That is, yeah, good things. Um, both in the research and development uh, um, area and in the market area. So we, we try to build that products and uh, uh, put them in the market. Specifically regarding and connecting to European and FC, one of the products that we have released and it's open source for commercial users is to identify. It's a wallet that is compatible with uh, FC, Lastria, Lagchain, with uh, right now adapting it to Polygon. And you can see the code and uh, get more knowledge about. Uh, the approach of the probably European Commission because we are working also in some of the larger scale pilots projects in the European uh, at the European scale. That's it. <coughs> and Astria, that is the um, uh, reason here. Um, it's uh, um, it's one of the largest public permission networks right now. I mean, probably. Yeah, I see all over the world um, globally. Uh, it was probably the first one inspired black inspired black chain that is in the Latin area, and I think it was prior to to FC. Um, it's built okay. Um, Alastria is also an association in Spain uh, with the aim to you know. Democratizes access to technology, blockchain technology, and, and strengthen and foster a public private ecosystem um, around blockchain. Okay. Um, you are gonna get access to the to the presentation, so yeah, there's more information there. Um, we are more than five uh, hundred members, that including half of the members being SMEs. The other half have been corporates or public sector. Um, some of the members that are participating in, the, in that association, but also in the networks, are Santander, Telefonica, uh, Repsol, really good corporates based in, in Spain. Uh, and all of them, all of us, we are participating in equal uh, circumstances. Um, we have no, it's not six, six in this case. Uh, two, two blockchain networks. Um, more figures about that. Um, and as this built on the basis of competition. So we have uh, a partners collaborating in infrastructure, partners collaborating in standards. Uh, we have a standard similar to the um, uh, SIF or right now IRF or you know, AS2, that is called the last AD. We've been working on that standard for the last thing, five years, something like that. And it's open, so all the members will collaborate at, at the infrastructure and, and standard levels, and then we compete um, for smart contracts and services to, to our customers. Okay. Um, in that case, we choose. 2019 to build up what we, we call then a public permission network. So it's a permission network that everybody can see what is happening there. Uh, at that time, I think it's were um, a really innovative, probably, um, concept. Right now, it's really well adopted, so no, nothing new. Uh, we have right now two networks. Yeah, we have two networks right now, one based on quorum. We collaborated uh, with JP Morgan, Chase, and then Consensus. Um, and then we um, introduced another one in 2022. Uh, Besu, we are trying to switch to and, and merge the data, the, the chains um, of all of them, but it's really you know, a process. Um, so we have some validator nodes and regular notes, so I will give you more information regarding that. Right now, there are more than 90 use cases documented in the network. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, sectors, economic sector, sectors, and mainly uh, notarization, that is, is an evidence registration, 
uh, identity, utilization, traceability. Um, okay. But also the association is really well, it's well representing being actively participating in all the decision spaces in blockchain, both in Europe and, and Latin. So I don't want to see how much time we have. Um, indeed, we, yeah, indeed, a lot of the Spanish participants in, in European projects are members of Alastria, okay, prior to participating on that, on that kind of projects. Also, we've been collaborating actively in fostering projects, in, 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 not only in Spain, in Worcester, in the last year, promoting the first um, regulation, not regulation, first uh, uh, technical documentation regarding digital identities, or the web was the um, uh, UNE, and we've been collaborating, uh, participating actively in the standardization organization forums, okay? Um, some projects are really, uh, um, and the last ID framework, in the different framework that it's open source, and you can see in GitHub, and more than 20, sorry, 200 members participating in that. So, <laughs> regarding the networks, uh, right now, these are the figures and the numbers of our of the networks. So, okay, we have the D network and the B network. The D meaning Celsius, uh, because why not? Uh, and the B network because of Pesu. Mm -hmm. We also started a P network that was Polygon and F network that was Fabric, but never, you know, we're still doing that. So there we with uh, Daniel, the hacker leader fabric was impossible to scale. So we we you know we start we stop doing that. Um, right now in our team network we have uh, 191 regular nodes, uh, six validator nodes. We could be we could be having more validator nodes, but we found that having more really hurts the performance of the network. So that is something that we're working on, that is rotating validators nodes, uh, because we want to maintain, you know, the, um, the neutrality of the network, but uh, not affecting the performance. Um, and it's something that we would like, we've been talking to you uh, in the future, I don't know who, uh, but yeah, we obviously work on that. Um, we have deployed the identity model, and uh, we have some progress in a decentralized monitoring system. That is something that we feel crucial because well, I will tell more about that. And in the B network, we restarted that in early 2022. Right now, 50 approx regular nodes, six validator nodes. Uh, there are some uh, you projects that have been deployed on top of that. Um, also, it's the oh, it's similar infrastructure as FC and LACnet, that is the LATAM network. Um, I wanted to give you this, um, this screenshot just, just to have the URL and just to see some um, numbers on the, on the network. Okay, how is you will get access to the PDF, so um, don't worry about that. Um, these are I'm not sure, I'm, I'm really, because I, I do the screenshot today, usually we have like 4,000 uh, transactions, so yeah, I don't know what happened today. Um, you have the GitHub, so anybody, any member can um, really uh, start a node and join the, the networks. That is for the network, B network, T network. And we've been working in off-chain governance, or as it's really important, and you can, uh, there's a link on the document so you can access. Uh, they are open to, to anyone that can see that. Obviously in Spanish, um, yeah, uh, we are the Spanish first in analysis. Um, yeah, although there are sessions that are in English, so you're welcome to join. Um, I want to show that because indeed we have 
come to a level of tranquility in the community governance. Really, right now, off chain. So we need to. Um, we wanted to be sure that we're having a balance on the governance between, you know, control and um, decentralization. Right now, we're on the on the way to implement that uh, on chain. Okay. Some lessons learned deploying. Um, I'm not sure because uh, are there. Uh, I think we feel that having 200 and nodes is, you know, uh, um, there is not a company having more than two nodes. It's really, it's really important. It's really a, a, a great project. Uh, so we wanted to do some, you know, lessons there. Um, this is our foundational, like, um, yeah, foundational ideas. Um, legal entities in, in the Alaska network are never anonymous. Are never anonymous. Uh, they have identification. Uh, you can't operate that as a legal entity being anonymous. Um, uh, the access is open and non discriminatory, but you have to be a member of Alaska okay? uh, to uh, write on the, on the networks, not to read, uh, not to read the network. Okay, everybody can read the network. Um, citizen and cultural protection is critical. Uh, the governance needs to be open and inclusive, and we should try to be as sustainable and eco friendly as, uh, as possible. Um, we needed a presenting uh, found a consensus algorithms that is. You know, when you have such a certain number of, of Daniel, uh, I'm not sure if right now the QVFT is supporting such an amount of uh, validator nodes. I'm not seeing, and when, I, when you put the, the performance, you show four validator nodes. Mm -hmm. What we have tested it behind six is really affecting the performance. No, I don't know if you are, yeah, yeah, that, you can, okay. <laughs> Because I was amazed about the number of validator nodes, but I think that the performance is hurt uh, exponentially with the number of of, uh, of validator nodes. Okay, and so we don't need that because we have uh, permission access to write. So uh, for this is okay to limit the number of nodes to six. Okay, but the problem is that um, yeah, the problem is that I'm gonna go here. Yeah. The problem is that if one validator node crashes or if one validator node is stuck, um, there is no way to rotate that. So we can have a compromised validator node and not being able to remove that, except if we do it manually. In the, this is going to be recorded. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I will tell you when we are not on record. Uh, some, <laughs> that, some issues that we have in the other I've deleted that from the presentation. Um, yeah, more details about that. Um, the question is, right now we're working on having validator nodes and having um, a standby validator nodes. So they are operated from different uh, entities, companies, members of Alaska, and you can rotate validator nodes between them. Not only in a basis of backup, but on a regular basis. So there is no way that um, a company or a potential attacker can know if a validator node is going to be validating uh, for, for a long time. Okay. Um, this is something that we are uh, okay, and we need to automate um, putting nodes in quarantine. Uh, we have learned that when you have such an amount of uh, companies operating nodes. Uh, you need a way to do that automatically. Um, so there's nobody telling a company you need to shut down your node or putting them away from the from the network. Okay, you need to automate that. Not sure if right now it's possible to do that, but uh, yeah, we're working on that. Um, and the other question is that we are working on a decentralized monitoring tool so we can, um, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, push out, you know, say 
say that, push up, or, you know, um, it's isolate a node from the network if it's not given the proper service level. Um, so, yeah, uh, I will give you some the, 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 the details here, but you can ask later. Uh, we usually um, um, have meetings and technology and strategy committees. Um, this is some of the questions in the, in the last one. Um, status, work in progress. We are trying to engage with a lot of different providers so we can make more interoperability in the network and implement some or, you know, make some experiments and innovate as we have done in the past. And uh, this is some of the other things we're working on. Also, implementations of monitoring and explorers and so on. Uh, regularly, we need to add additional ones. Um, and then this is a figure of a denial of service. Uh, uh, I need to uh, give more details of the record. And yeah, some other things that I wanted to talk about later. Um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, thank you very much. If you want to join Alastria, um, you're open to, to join us. And, check more information there. Um, okay, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, can you close the record? Yep. So we can thank go you. into the <laughs> disclosure. Yeah, yeah. Disclosure.